Okay, uh, I, I'm a foreigner in the land of interpreting. I've done most of my work on written translation. And what's worse, I'm an academic. Very pleased to communicate with professionals. I'm very happy to do that. And one of the great things about events like this is that somebody from outside the profession and outside of the academic discipline can wander in like babes in Toyland and ask the stupid questions. Now, here's a question for you, all the experts. You know that, that European laws, all the directors and regulations, when they're translated and published, they're not translations anymore, legally, because they're all legally valid. They are parallel versions, right? That works for the written translations. Does it work for oral productions, for interpret? Don't answer now. <laughs> Uh, we're going to find out later on. And if no, is it true for the whole lot, for all the courts, for the interpreting? Okay, I've got you thinking, right? So while you're thinking about that, I'm going to talk about other things. Here's a story for you. I've gone back to Australia. I'm in Melbourne at the top of a big building looking out there, and I'm getting drunk on Australian beer with an interpreter who's been working in the Northern Territory, that's right up at the top end, and working with Aboriginals in the courts. And he's telling me this story, that he was there, and he was pointing out to a judge that the interpreter, the, 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 the accused, um, tends to say yes when in doubt. It's called gratuitous acquiescence. It's a well-noted thing of many languages, but Australian Aboriginal languages and Creole do this all the time. And so this has to be interpreted in the court, and the interpreter alerts the judge to this fact. To which the judge replies, <coughs> where did you get your PhD from? I'm an interpreter. An interpreter. Okay, now, um, actually, the... the uh, interpreter was telling me this because after that he went off to the city and got his PhD. And I said, right, so now you can go back and tell the judge. He said, no, 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 now I'm too well paid. I'm not going back to the bush. <laughs> now, that story is a story, but it, it's something that um, affects us and our social contexts. And I think you can see if you analyze that story that there are three things happening. It's not us against the world. It's not us and society. There are certain systems at work here. One is the judge. Okay? And I'm going to talk about a legal system, but also I'm going to extend that to every, system, every part of that system that pretends to have legal repercussions. So the legislative, the parliamentary, that whole deal. I'm looking at, I'm going to call it the legalistic system, but it's not a good word, but you'll see what I mean, okay? For those systems to work, each utterance must be truthful. It's just an assumption of the system. Interpreters entering that system supply utterance, but they also supply a, a risk factor, a lot of doubt about the truth value. It's a perturbation, perturbation, it, it's a disturbance in the norms of the legalistic system, and the turning there was to a third system, which is the education system. So the story actually brings together those three systems in their quite complex interrelationships of dependency and non-comprehension. We're in that now, actually. We've got here the interpreters and we've got some academics. I just want to pause to thank the organizers for yesterday when we saw that we have gone well beyond this stupid dichotomy of theorists in the academy and practitioners out there, theory versus practice. What we saw yesterday was a third term. Just a little bit of research. Research the practice of research, into the conversation, be it on gender or be it on politically incorrect language, changes that discussion entirely. We were all able to talk about not just our own opinions, but 
about what we're learning from that research. It, it focuses on a common discussion. And I thought that was a tremendous relationship between these two systems, which are not always happy with each other. And I hasten to point out uh, that when I was accused of recycling uh, stereotypes about women, nobody cares what I think about women. That's of no importance at all. My question was really, was it in the data? Did the age variable come out in the data? Let's go back to the data and let's talk about that uh, rather than us against you or what we think about women, men, politically incorrect politicians, the whole lot. Okay, so there's our three systems. Now I'm taking this from the German sociologist Niklas Luhmann, who has been applied to translation studies. I was never able to understand how you could apply Luhmann because he says that a system comprises communication, pure communication, and there is no communication between systems. And I think, wait a minute, translators, interpreters, whatever they do, communicate in systems. You see the importance of the story. I assumed, as do many people, systems are language, language systems, or cultures, a cultural system. No, dealing closer into Luhmann and looking at his writings, the systems are not there. The systems are the legal system, the education system. And then he doesn't talk about interpreting, but we might be able to apply it. For Luhmann, there is no communication between systems. There's only, his term is irritation, irritation in German, doesn't it? But he also talks about dependence. And I find this helpful, strangely helpful. It means that when you're trying to explain to a judge things about interpreting, don't expect that judge to understand you because the sociologist has already said there's no communication between systems. It's not going to be easy, but there can be something else. Dependence or irritation. And I want to look at those instances of dependence and irritation between systems. He uses other metaphors for it. Uh, resonance. Resonance is another term that comes into that when, when systems are dealing with each other without really communicating. Those three systems that I talked about come together or, or when one deals with a very simple question, who says who interprets? Who in selects the interpreter? How is that done socially? Now, it's done in many, many ways. We saw some of them yesterday, okay? Uh, the pleasant voice thing. I, I put it in because it was such a nice example from yesterday, okay? Uh, and, and where people come from and what are their allegiances, for example, and we could talk about social capital in a Bourdieu sense, and that all works. Fair enough. Then the education system plays a role as well, depending on the kind of interpreting, depending on the country, depending on the epoch. But the legalistic system has its own filters operative there as well for people who are going to work in that system. Okay? And finally, there are filters, there are selection processes, which I won't, I pro, I'll never complain about technicians again, okay. <laughs> might be considered though of an interpreting system. And I'm interested here, not just in how those three systems interact, but what is the strength and vitality of the interpreting system itself to determine its own membership. That is, is there a system in any strong sense? And I want to do that by looking at some examples. Now, that doesn't mean that it's either one or the other. Most uh, the systems coming together in many different and creative ways. This is from the Spain's Criminal Justice Act 1882, still valid, where the interpreter can be chosen has passed the state exam. Okay, and the state exam is within the legalistic system, so it's going to look after itself. But if you can't find anybody, a teacher, education system. 
can't find a teacher. Well, anybody who speaks a language. <laughs> Which happens. I'll translate for you. Uh, what, um, if, to the translator, it was all Greek to him. So now about Chino, it's all Greek to him. All right, okay. They suspend a trial against an Asian woman. I can't see Oriental in English, can I? Uh, because the interpreter didn't know Spanish. You see, the law didn't say which language. They just said, el idioma. Hmm? Okay. And the other one is uh, uh, a, a trial is postponed because the only translator of Chinese was the accused. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so so it's not all the time, and I don't want to say it's worse in Spain than anywhere else, but there are horror stories, and there are horror stories all around the world. Uh, this question is not easy. Uh, look up and see how the interpreters for Nuremberg were selected as well. That's, that's quite amazing. Um, there was a process in the United States uh, using the State Department uh, 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 processes, but then they, they had real trouble for finding people with German French, German Russian, and it came down to people who were friends of friends of the families of the judges. So uh, the social networking also plays its role. Now, my question then is, is interpreting a system in any of these senses, okay? And I'm going to answer it by looking at some hypotheses and then some test cases where we see the different systems coming together. Now, I think interpreting might be a system because there is still, I suggest, the prestige of conference interpreting. You may have doubts about it. Yesterday the doubts were rife. But outside, well, all my Chinese students really want to be Zhang Lu. Uh, this is the ideal, the, the interpreter has all the correct Chinese-English idioms all stored and it comes out perfect and a star, a real star. Uh, people who are bald and male have to aspire to lesser ideals. Uh, Pavel Balashenko was famous as being the man who knew more about nuclear disarmament than either the presidents he, he dealt with because the Russians kept dying off quickly in that period. And for the rest of us who can't aspire to those, there's always <laughs> Ni Nicole Kidman. Will do. Okay. Now, these are not banal things. A system works on the illusion, as Bourdieu would have it, that it can work that there is this prestige value and motivation and pressure to enter that system uh, from outside. So the system works as much on those who want to come in and are excluded from it as those who are actually in it. Uh, so I, I, I keep this here as serious suggestions that there is some kind of a social system working. Second piece of evidence, this is a, a map, if you will, of the uh, associations of translators and interpreters. And we've got their size up there, your members, and the years in which they were created. Do not ask me what each dot, dot represents, please. Okay? I could look it up if you want. But we've got, obviously, here in the, in the um, is it going to work? Yes, look at that. Uh, in the 50s, you had this heroic age of the profession was one profession, uh, when you got uh, AIC founded, you got CUT, and you got FIT, Fédération Internationale des Traducteurs. You know, and these big things were founded in the 50s, and interpreting was there uh, in AIC as an independent professional identity uh, from that heroic age. Okay? And that has been tremendously important for the, 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 the formation of the image, the, the uh, exclusive uh, nature of the profession focused on conference interpreting, and the creation since then of all these other associations for interpreters. What interests me in the map is not 
the role of AIC particularly, but the fact that it has not maintained a hegemonic position, not as it's been accused of that, uh, and that other associations have propped up for interpreters for many, many diverse uh, reasons. Okay, uh, I found two in Shanghai, which is strange. The city has two associations for training conference interpreters. All right. Uh, but other ones are the public service uh, uh, interpreting crisis in the United Kingdom, spawned new associations there. Others have been court interpreters, others for police interpreters, and there's the activist interpreters of battles in the, in the social forum uh, as well. Okay? So this tells us something about the profession and its systemic nature. Uh, there was... Uh, a solid basis for a unified hegemonic professionalism. Lots of other things have been happening there. And that's manifested in that breakup of the... It's not a breakup because there are also other functions. I mean, AIC has a gatekeeping function and these other ones are more into solidarity, social services, distributing information, distributing jobs, or a whole lot of other work that associations can do. The very nature of the professional association has changed over the years. I point out in passing that uh, what we might call legal or legalistic translation broke away from the ruck much earlier and is also very strong. All these associations include translators and interpreters together focusing on legal issues. And the very big one there is, is uh, in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, in uh, Argentina and Uruguay and other countries in South America, one is trained as a traductor publico. That means one is trained as a legal translator by default, which accounts for that there. Okay. Other evidence on the identity of the profession. This is from, an, it's not an association, it's a company in the United States called Interpret America. And they did a survey of lots of interpreters there because they want to make money out of them, it being a company, and we got the salaries. And it's a strange kind of map because the poor salaries, the lower salaries are on the right, so you know, okay, and we can see that there's a double hump at least. You've got high paid conference interpreters out here getting paid a lot more than the rump of people who would be more or less professional. Uh, what we call in this country community interpreters, and then a whole lot of part-timers, the fringe of the profession down there. Uh, as much as that company wants to have a forum for discussion, uh, the very data that they compile show that there is not a uniform social group there uh, at work. I want to enter so into a few cases um, on the borders of these. Okay, so, so my, my hypothesis is that the interpreting system was much stronger back in the 50s, 60s, and that it's been subject to a series of threats and events, much of those uh, uh, of the kind that Franz pointed out yesterday, and, and that Daniel as well, with, with the problem of the identity and the imbalance between the different kinds of interpreting. There's a whole set of new problems that come up. Back to my topic, though, of the systems. Us against the lawyers. Now, this is a... Oh, lawyers are so beautiful. This is a wonderful piece of argumentation. Okay, so at the trial in New York, the accused is speaking Spanish, and they use that in order to throw Hispanic jurors off the jury because they would not be listening to the same evidence as everybody else. Which means that no Hispanic will ever have anybody Hispanic in the jury. Oh, it's beautiful. Isn't it? Don't you get it? And, and this comes back to something that Lumen says about the legal system as being essentially monolingual. It cannot handle the doubts of transfer between languages uh, because it creates situations of inequality. Uh, this is an extreme case, but it, it does have its, its beauty. 
That is uh, the lawyers manipulating language diversity. Politicians are also able to do it. The uh, exiled Catalan president, Carlos Puigdemont, uh, went to a trial in Flanders, in Belgium, and chose to have the trial in Dutch rather than French, even though he and his fellow I was going to say renegades. No, I can't do that. He and his fellow exiled politicians uh, spoke French. Why would he choose to have it in Dutch rather than French? Well, because the Dutch are going to be more uh, sympathetic towards the cause of small nationalisms, breakaway nationalisms, of course. Uh, so uh, lawyers can manipulate the fact of interpreting. Politicians can manipulate it as well. Sometimes interpreters are called upon to react against this manipulation. Uh, recently, uh, Trump discussing we don't know what with Putin. Uh, the English speaker in the room was the interpreter and the United States uh, Committee of Inquiry wanted to call upon the interpreter to testify about what was said. This is a point of professional ethics. And here the AIC came out very quickly and very clearly saying, no, she cannot, because confidentiality is a key point of professional ethics. But then I'm looking at who the interpreter was, and she's a public servant employed by the State Department, employed by the same system uh, that is asking her to testify. And it's not so obvious in legal terms whether or not she did have to testify. Now, it, at the end, uh, uh, she hasn't, as far as I know, or if she did, she didn't do it publicly. And I'm hoping that all sides came to see that there are mutual benefits from the possibility of having heads of state speak to each other without any official record being there, that, that, that human to human oral communication has a real value over and beyond uh, the inquiry of the legalistic system. But there it remains. Now, I hasten to point out that as much as Australia is in advance of everybody in every respect with regard to interpreting, uh, it's Code of Ethics is written by Nati, and Nati is a company comprising the governments of the states and the Federation of Australia, which happens to be the main employer of interpreters. So you've got a Code of Ethics written by the employer. Uh, and it's very clear that if that happened in Australia, the interpreter would have to testify. One final test case. These are just, just interesting cases where you can see when Lumen talks about irritation and dependency, it, it, there isn't communication. There, there are dirty tricks being played all along these boundaries between systems. When uh, the uh, Ministry of Justice in the United Kingdom decided that it was going to outsource all of its interpreting services, the interpreters were not happy. Uh, now, we might think that the outsourcing was a separation of the profession from the legalistic system and would be good. But the outsourcing went through a pi private company, Applied Language Solutions, which, it was claimed, was going to reduce the qualifications needed and reduce the payment. So we had interpreters becoming very activist, activistic against this, and going on strike, essentially closing down uh, thousands of trials in order to return to the legalistic system. Uh, in the end, uh, there was a, a, an inquiry, as you can see there, uh, in, the, uh, in the parliament, and new tenders were called, and, and another company took over and gave better conditions we hope. So, is there an interpreting system? 
Well, yes, we can look at the ethics, we can look at the stars, we can look at the number of associations, and there's a certain uh, energy there within the system. A system in Humboldt's terms needs energy, means intellectual activity going on. Uh, it can't just be this beautiful uh, set of rules that people apply, uh, apply to, and certainly those are factors which could describe interpreting as a growing and dynamic system. However, elements of the ethics are not very clear and can be trumped, and it's not a pun on Donald Trump there because I've, my case was in Australia, and there are signs of confused or conflicting identity. This uh, was drawn up by people working on sign interpreting, claiming that sign language interpreters were there less professionalized at that stage than teachers, social workers, or nurses, uh, but we might consider that different parts of the interpreting professions are at different points along that scale, and very few would have any claim to being fully professionalized in terms of the liberal professions uh, on the right of that schema. <coughs> Let's go back to my original question. Are interpreters' renditions... Apostrophe missing, I apologize. Well, the answer is no, you're quite right. And, and I got it from the same source that Magdalena worked on, that uh, on the website it just says very, very clearly that the, the interpretation one is listening to there is not an authentic record of the proceedings. Uh, why? Because the authentic record is written. Authenticity is written. The legal system needs the fixity of the written word to attach its truth to. And orality, I think, is still one feature that we would associate with interpreting. Much as there are all these other hybrid technological possibilities going around. And if we look back at the legal system, we find that interpreting lacks some of the features that enable um, the legal sense of truth to be attached to language. For legalistic systems, the spoken will always be subordinate to the written. At Nuremberg, since we have the exhibition here, they needed six interpreters per language. Okay, and they were hard to find. But they had to have nine stenographers and 12 translators per language. It was written. Takeaways for you. Don't expect legal systems to understand interpreting. Just don't expect it. I mean, if you get the message through, great. But they're different systems and we, we're condemned to working on these relations of irritation and dependence. But when Luhmann goes back and talks about irritation, he goes back to a strange place. It's because we're in France, but anyway, Descartes. It's also because we're, we're all talking about emotions, and emotions are an important part of any communication. Uh, Luhmann says it corresponds to admiratio, admiration, which is, for Descartes, the first of the passions because all the other passions have opposites, and this one doesn't. It's the prime point of contact between systems when you say, what? What's that? What's going on? Hey! Uh, this is the sense of irritation that, that Lumen talks about in some places, okay? And that's where we have to work on it. I irritation can also mean going on strike and agitating. It can also mean presenting evidence, as academics can do. But don't expect to sit down and have a rational conversation with people in a different system. You're going to have to work on creating, if you can get a bit of admiration for yourself, it might be good. Better though, I think, to create that admiratio, that surprise even, by drawing on the virtues of the spoken. I said, for example, that all people eventually agree that it's good for world leaders to sit down and talk with each other in private as much as they can. 
but it's just a good human thing to have for everybody. That is a virtue of the spoken. It's also good to have oral parliaments where people get together and speak. Because when you're face to face, you act in a, in, a, in a very different way from people writing separate from each other. You have to work together and you're aware that communication produces something that's greater than the sum of the parts. Something that is greater than the sum of the parts. Okay? For that extent, I put it to you that the interpreters dealing with that politically incorrect language that we saw yesterday are given to be risk averse. I know this, I know that all translators, all interpreters, the first reaction is to be risk averse. Avoid the problem if you can. But one of the things that spoken communication does is create that irritation and that problematic nature. So when it was repeated, of course the interpreters went for it, took the risk and repeated the politically incorrect language. That's part of what spokenness is. And I would like translators and interpreters to be greater risk takers, to make events happen, to make the oral play its proper role in human-to-human -human events. There is a small envoi. You're never out of the woods of this play of system against systems. The work on the Aboriginal's ac gratuitous acquiescence uh, is elaborated and worked on in several trials by Diana Eads, who wrote an excellent oldish article here. And she describes how the Aboriginals in the trials were not communicating with people or not being understood because uh, yes doesn't mean I agree and silence does mean I agree, for example. And so she wrote a handbook as Australians are doing, it's very good, you know, write this up, educate people about it. And she wrote up the handbook of how to work with Aborigines giving uh, uh, Aboriginal witnesses or, or, or accused in, in the court. And then she found that the lawyers had picked up her handbook, that her hand, she was at the trial, and she saw the lawyers there attacking the, the Aboriginal witnesses using precisely the strategies uh, that she had pointed out. Academic knowledge, research, the bits of things that we produce don't serve any master. We put it out there. If it's good for you to discuss, that's great. The other side can pick it up and use that too. Our role as academics is to put out material that you professionals can discuss. Thank you very much.